You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet made possible in part by a grant from Springpoint Partners. Visit waterloop.org for all of our content. This is episode number 136, The Wonder and Weirdness of Water. Water is a rather simple chemical compound with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Yet this seemingly basic substance is necessary for all known forms of life comprises two-thirds of the human body, and covers 70% of the earth. Water also displays a wide range of unique behaviors, such as how it sticks to itself, goes against gravity, and dissolves many other substances. The wonder and weirdness of water is discussed in this episode with Alok Jha, author of The Water Book. He talks about water's strange properties, cosmic origins, arrival on this planet, and presence throughout the universe. Alex says that although water is arguably the most studied substance in history, it is also one of the most mysterious. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. I am very excited for this episode to be joined by Alok Jha. He is author of The Water Book, which I have here with me. Uh, He's also a journalist at The Economist. Alok, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure, Travis. So, uh, you know, as a as like a big time water geek, as a science lover, as someone that's a, just fascinated by the history of the planet, uh, and loves good writing and journalism, I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, your book is fantastic. I really encourage anybody who's interested in water uh, and and the wonder of water to to read this. I know it came out a few years ago, but I finally just got around to it myself. Um, and like I was saying before, we started recording, you know, every page is just chock full of fantastic information. You did an amazing job <laughs> capturing water. It's not an easy thing to do. What what compelled you to to put this book together to write this? Well, I mean, it's very kind of you to say all those things. And I tell you, it was, it was, um, it, 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 despite the fact that the book's several hundred pages long, I feel like I only just scratch the surface in terms of how interesting and strange and important and weird water is. I mean, I'll tell you what, the, the, the book came from um, a conversation I was having with my agent uh, many, many years ago. He's asked me for ideas of books and things. He said, well, well, what interests you? And I was like, well, quite a few things. And one of which was, why is, why is water the only thing that's pH 7, pH being the scale for acid and alkali, right? So um, anything that's a uh, pH 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's an acid, and anything beyond pH 7, so 8, 9, 10 beyond, that's an alkali. So, well, why is it that water is the only thing that's pH 7? Well, the reason is, is because we've defined the pH scale using water. Water is the most common liquid on the earth, and so when they were deciding what the scales were going to be, they decided that water was the neutral thing. That was the one that's going to be pH 7. But there's another reason why uh, water is uh, the sort of central bit of that, and it's because um, it's because um, w- when you're deciding what an acid is, an acid is a concentra- Another way of deciding what an acid is is to say what is the concentration of H plus ions, hydrogen ions. That- that's an acid. When you're deciding what an alkali is, well, you- what you're really saying is what's the concentration in that solution of OH minus ions, o- hydroxide ions. The only thing with an equal number of H and OH is water, mm. H2O. That's exactly what it is. Now, when you start to unpick these tiny, weird, niggling questions, and I'm, I'm, I'll admit that was a strange thing to be wondering, wondering over lunch <laughs> with a person. But anyway, I was wondering this thing. When you start to unpick it, though, you realize that water isn't just this thing in the background of life. It's the thing that makes life. It's the thing that makes civilization. It's the thing that makes everything. And actually, once you start to... Uh, tangled and pull these little threads you get all these stories about chemistry about the history of the earth about the history of humanity about the history of life itself and what i tried to do was was just collect some of those and and put them into a book yeah oh fantastic that's interesting how you know we've set so many things like the ph scale and also freezing and boiling right based off of of water um the temperature you know, scale exactly yeah temperature scale uh so water, when you, what if you ask the question, what is water, right? There, there's a lot of ways to answer that, perhaps. But from a scientific perspective, what is water? 
Well, water is a chemical compound made of two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. And that should be the end of it, really. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just there's many, many compounds in the, in the universe that do all sorts of different things. And we've created um, chemical theories and physics theories to describe the, the, the sort of richness of the, of the universe. And it should apply to water, too. It, it, they contain molecules we understand, hydrogen and oxygen. Um, they contain the kinds of forces we understand, uh, covalent bonding. But weird thing is that water doesn't behave like any other liquid uh, that we know about. You know, there is this thing in chemistry called the theory of liquids, which helps you to predict how liquids will behave and how they, uh, they, they act and all sorts of things. But it doesn't really do much to help you understand water. So when you ask me the question, what is water? Well, water is just a chemical compound. But it's like a chemical compound like no other mm. because it doesn't behave like other chemical compounds. You can't predict how it's going to behave based around its molecular weight or the way its um, molecules interact with other things. And it therefore has these very strange properties that um, other liquids don't have. And you think, well, fine, why, it has some strange properties. Why is that interesting? Well, if it didn't have these strange properties, and we can go into some of those, if we didn't have those strange properties there would be nothing on the earth that we'd recognize. You know, life wouldn't exist. The, uh, the, 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 the weather system wouldn't work in the way it does. In fact, you can probably extend this to the universe. There's probably all sorts of things in the universe that just wouldn't be the same if water didn't act so weirdly. So it's a liquid, but a very strange one. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things I enjoy in the book is like you go into all the different strange, unique ways that it, that it behaves. Um, and, you know, the idea just that it has these three states, right? It's It's got liquid, solid, gas. I guess there's other compounds that have those states, right? Um, could you talk about some of these other things, like uh, how it sticks to itself, uh, how it's like this universal solvent, how it goes against gravity, uh, the way ice floats? Now, that's a lot to go into, but maybe you can just kind of pick some of those things or, or hit, hit on them a little bit. Well, let's start with that last one, right? So, um, as part for, for the research on the book, um, I took a trip to Antarctica, and um, and one of the things you notice when you make your way to Antarctica is, as you go across the ocean, you'll see icebergs, sort of a few hundred kilometers out from the coast, and these are magnificent things. I mean, they're enormous pieces of Antarctica that have built up. These ice sheets have built up over thousands of years, and then they snap off and they sort of float into the uh, ocean, and you're seeing them, and they're. they're probably older than all of human civilization. They've taken 20, 30, 40,000 years to create, and they'll go off and melt into the uh, ocean. But you're seeing these things, and they're floating. You can see the iceberg tip at the top, and it's amazing things. Um, but if you think about it for a second, as amazing as it is that this iceberg is older than all of human civilization, the more amazing thing is that you can actually see the iceberg at all, mm. because a solid of anything shouldn't float on its own liquid. If you think about physics and chemistry, there were, it, well, when something becomes colder, generally speaking, it condenses. And when things condense, they become more dense. And, you know, if you put a dense, something dense into something less dense, it should float to the bottom or sink to the bottom, rather. And any other liquid, that's what happens. But with water, as soon as it freezes, it floats to the top. You know, and we, we kind of ignore this fact. Every time we have a drink with an ice cube in it and it floats, we just don't even notice how weird that is. And, you know, I'll get into this later perhaps, but that's kind of one of the things that kind of water in its way has persuaded humanity, humans, to not realize how normal, how abnormal it really is. We don't notice any of these things, even though it is very <laughs> abnormal. And so water floats because when um, its molecules come together to form the crystal of ice, they leave a lot of space in their formation. So you imagine a water molecule looks a bit like this. It's sort of a shallow V shape with the oxygen at the top here and the hydrogens at the sort of ends at the ends of the V. And so when they're in the water, a liquid, they're sort of floating around in all sorts of directions and they're quite dense. When they get into the solid, the ice, they form very rigid patterns, which leaves a lot of space between the molecules. And therefore, ice happens to be less dense than water of the same temperature, so it floats. Now, th that's just bizarre, right? But if it didn't, if it wasn't the case that this happened, then you wouldn't see life on Earth. I'll tell you why. Well, for example, for one thing, one of the things that, uh, that this behavior has done is that um, when, when um, 
when a, when a, a lake or a river or something freezes over the top, what, it, what it's doing is insulating the water underneath. And so over time in the history of the Earth, as there have been ice ages and extreme winters and all these sorts of things, um, it means that there's always been a place, uh, there's always been liquid water somewhere on the Earth for life, for plants, fish, whatever, to, to keep living whilst the rest of the Earth's surface is completely frozen over. And in the three and a half billion years uh, that life has, has existed on Earth, um, there's always been somewhere for life to continue evolving continuously so that it's now um, in the, so life now has the rich variation that we see around us today. If water froze from the bottom up like anything else, then every time there's an ice age or an extreme winter on the Earth, Every single life form living in lakes and ponds and whatever else would have been completely destroyed. Everything on the surface of the earth would have been completely destroyed. So that means that we'd have had to start evolution all over again, every single time. And you just wouldn't have this rich diversity of life you see around you. So, you know, it sounds like a really, not a really sort of curiosity thing, but actually with well, the fact that ice floats is very, very bizarre. There are other examples as well. Uh, another particularly interesting um, property of water is that it has a very very high surface tension and uh, what i mean by that is that if you look or if you, if you think of a pond skater those little insects that sort of mm. skate along the surface of ponds and you look at a picture of one of those you'll see that it's it's uh, it's sort of legs are sort of on the water and the water is sort of dipped underneath it but it doesn't go through the surface and that's because these insects are very light and they can't break through the surface of the water because the water itself likes to stick to itself and it's so strong that barrier that the, the insect can't actually penetrate it um and the water itself likes to stick to itself that more than it likes to stick to anything else around it um and that's because of the way that different water molecules attract each other so as i said to you before the water molecule is this shallow v-shape and there's the oxygen here and the hydrogens at the end uh, the electrical charge across this molecule is not evenly distributed. What happens is that the hydrogens at the sort of ends down here, they, they're slightly, slightly more positive, positively charged than the oxygen in the middle, which is slightly more negatively charged. Now these are fractional charges, nothing major. But over the course of trillions of water molecules, what happens is that these each water molecule will attract other ones. So the fact that this hydrogen atom, uh, hydrogen atom at the, in the corner of one uh, water molecule is slightly positively charged. It means it attracts the oxygen uh, molecule, uh, the oxygen atom of a different water molecule. And this is called hydrogen bonding. It's very weak. It's very ephemeral. They, they form and they break constantly within a liquid water. But it means that there's just a little bit more cohesion within the water liquid than there is for other, uh, other chemicals that are similar. So it means the water sticks together a bit more. And over the course of, as I said, trillions of molecules, it can do some interesting things. Well, one of them is the high surface tension I mentioned so that insects can't go through. Another one is that if you put water in a very, very narrow tube and um, put it at the bottom, it will work against the force of gravity and it will draw itself up this narrow tube to the top of the tube. And you think, well, that's great. Why is that interesting? Well, this is how capillaries in your bloodstream work. This is how the uh, water gets from the roots of a plant all the way to the top by these very narrow tubes. And it's using the chemistry of water, this very strange chemistry of water, which nothing else does, by the way, to allow water to get to the different parts of a body or a plant. And it's because fundamentally at, chem at the chemical level, water creates these large numbers of hydrogen bonds that allow it to do all these quite interesting things <laughs> to overcome gravity is pretty is pretty interesting and remarkable um I, I love that you went into all those different facets the one other thing that i wondered if you could talk about is it's uh its ability to be such a, a dissolver of of things right it has this incredible ability and that's really fascinating too yeah uh if you if you know anything about the history of science um, you know, a lot of the early scientists in the middle, uh, in the sort of 16th, 17th century, they're all alchemists. And alchemists were looking for this universal solvent. They wanted something that dissolves everything. And they looked for all sorts of things. And what they kind of didn't realize, uh, Isaac Newton, he was an alchemist himself. You know, he, he was looking for this universal solvent. What he didn't even realize was that they already had it with them. It was water. Water dissolves everything. 
it's absolutely amazing at dissolving things. Um, and that's because, again, of this chemical structure. So I described earlier that there's a slight um, polarity in its charge, so that one part of the molecule is slightly more positive than the other, and that one part of the molecule is slightly more negative in terms of electrical charge. And that means that when it comes across anything else, this difference in charge acts like a kind of, um, it's kind of like a, um, what, what, what's the good way of saying it? It kind of, it kind of maneuvers other things around. So to say, for example, salt, common salt, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a, is a molecule that we're all familiar with. We eat it every day. And it's um, an ionic molecule. This means that there's a, there's a positively charged ion um, of sodium and a negatively charged ion of chlorine. And these things are stuck together electrostatically and they create a crystal of salt. But once you put it in water, these water molecules come along and the fact that um, the fact that the hydrogen atom in the water is slightly positively charged sees this, it, it will see this um, slightly negatively charged chlorine um, atom in the, um, in the water, uh, in the salt uh, crystal and it will just rip it off. And the same with the oxygen atom in the water molecule, when it sees the slightly positively charged sodium atom in the uh, crystal, water crystal, in the sodium, in the salt crystal, it will rip that off. Within minutes, you'll, the entire crystal will be ripped apart because the electrical charge in the water molecule essentially rips apart um, whatever it's coming across. And it will do this not just for ionic solids like sodium chloride, but for other things as well. Anything where there's a slight change in the charge uh, of the molecule, electrical charge, water molecule will just take advantage of it and rip it apart, which means that virtually everything will dissolve to some extent in water. And it also weirdly means that um, it's very, 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 very hard to find any pure water anywhere, because as soon as pure water comes into contact with anything else, whether it's just the air around you, it will dissolve stuff from the air as well. Um, as soon as it comes into contact with anything else, it will dissolve it. And so it's very hard to find pure water. Now, it turns out all of that is very useful for life. Uh, another thing you talk about in the book is, you know, water in our body. Uh, we're what, 60%, two thirds water, mm. which is a big portion of, of a human. Um, what's, what's water's role in our body? How does it, how does it uh, you know, move around and what does it functions does it serve in, in our bodies? Uh, this is something I always amazes me is that we, we are, as you said, two thirds water in our bodies and we drink water every day. And, you know, um, you know, you, thirst is you know incredibly is a visceral feeling and yet we, people often don't know what water is doing inside you and my answer to this is well, what isn't it doing inside you basically water is the thing that makes all your biological molecules work um it, it transports energy between your cells it does all of the stuff that's um that, that makes your makes makes life function so people talk about dna and proteins as the things that um sort of build life and that we're carbon-based life forms well i would say that actually water is the is the backdrop upon which all of that works now, let me give you an example so um we're, we're made of proteins all, all life on earth is made of proteins um and they make up the structures of our cells um they make up the molecules that allow cells to communicate with each other all sorts of things like that. And of course, DNA itself is the code um, that then um, um, allows the, the body to make pro the, the proteins it needs. But none of that would work without water. What do I mean by that? Well, when a protein is made in a cell, it's made by linking together lots of smaller molecules, amino acids, into a long sort of floppy chain, sort of carbon-based chain with lots of other elements attached to it. And this floppy chain is pretty useless as, as if it was just left like that, what it needs is to fold into its three-dimensional shape, and then it can do whatever it's doing, whether it's um, being, a, being a, a, a molecule that communicates or building a cell wall, whatever it's doing, but it needs to fold. And the only the way it folds is to be put, dissolved into water. And what, what it does is that each molecule of um, each, each protein that's created has bits on it that are slightly hydrophobic, which means they don't like water. And some of, some of the bits on the uh, protein molecule are hydro, hydrophilic, which means they do like water. So when you put this long floppy molecule into the water, the hydrophilic bits 
stay on the outside and the hydrophobic bits sort of just, just move into the inside. And so it folds into this intricate 3D shape um, that allows it to then go off and do whatever it's meant to do. And when proteins don't fold properly, that's when you get problems and diseases and mm -hmm. all sorts of other things. So it's a very important function. DNA doesn't work without being dissolved in water first. You know, um, I, I told you earlier that another way that you, you to move energy from inside a cell to outside or vice versa, you need chains of water molecules that essentially move energy backwards and forwards through. That's how energy moves between in and out of cells. It's doing all these things. It's, it's making the, making you function. Um, and that's why you need water. That's why you need to drink water all the time. And that's why it's kind of one of the most fundamental things, uh, access to water in the world. Yeah, I think when people say water is life, they probably don't have a full understanding of all those mechanisms that, that make that statement so true, right? That's, that's it really awesome. is life, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, all of water's properties, the ways it, way it behaves, fascinating. Uh, water's role in the body, fascinating. One of the things that that boggles my mind that I love to think about is where water came from, right? In a cosmic sense. Um, and so I really enjoyed uh, the education I got in your book about the early days, the early moments, whatever, of the universe and how water arose and uh, became part of this planet. Um, the idea that it's out there in other places in the universe because of the, how how it originated um, that is a multi-hour conversation but, but uh, what's what's the what's the short version here for folks this is actually a really great story it tells you about the the, the, fun, the this is where the fundamentalness of water in the universe it really is incredibly fundamental it's until recently we didn't know this that water is probably the second most common molecule in the universe we didn't know it was so common until until the last few decades um and the story of where water comes from on earth is, is very interesting so basically at the beginning of the universe uh 13.7 billion years ago at the big bang um you know the universe is created and a few seconds later that's when all of the um all of the universe's hydrogen is created. So the hydrogen is the simplest molecule. There's one proton and one neutron and one electron going around it. And so for, for a long time, that's all there was in the universe. And it, the, the expansion of the universe happens, and it, it doesn't happen in a very uniform way. There are clumps of hydrogen. And where the where the clumps of hydrogen exist, they turn into sort of slightly denser clumps because they come in, come together because of gravity. And it, some of those clumps become stars. Uh, and a star is just a, a cloud of hydrogen that's sort of collapsed in gravity and it starts to shine. And the, in the center of the star, the hydrogen will fuse into helium. And as that fusion happens, it shines. And that's how stars form. And now this first generation of stars are, are sort of big and they burn fast and they don't live very long. And what happens when they, when they run out of fuel and they can't fuse anymore in the center is they explode into these enormous um, explosions, which we call, which eventually result in what we call planetary nebulae. And you must see, have seen pictures of these. Um, they're some of those beautiful pictures that NASA and others publish, these sort of epic multicolored pictures of um, that look like cat's eyes. And there's a very famous one called the Pillars of Creation, um, which, which are like dozens of light years across. And what these are, are the, the, the sort of remnants of ancient stars. And they're clouds of dust that contain hydrogen, helium, plus a few of the other simpler elements, uh, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. cetera. And um, th they were created in, the, in, the, in, the, in these first generation of stars. And they, they, they spread through the universe. But within these, cl these clouds of dust, these planetary nebulae, there's plenty of hydrogen. And so there are new stars forming. And our sun, the is a star that formed in a planetary nebula that is the result of the death of one of these old stars. So where am I going with this? Well, we've got the hydrogen. We know that from the beginning of the universe. So what we need now is oxygen. And oxygen is swirling in this dust cloud around this new, uh, around our baby sun, essentially. There's hydrogen and oxygen in the, in the clouds around. And what happens is that there's also lots and lots and lots of infinite numbers of tiny grains of carbon you know, thousands of a width of human hair, just sort of floating in space. And occasionally a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom 
will hit one of these carbon grains um, just, you know, just completely randomly. Most of the time they'll bounce off, nothing will happen. But occasionally they'll come together and they'll fuse or they'll bond and they'll stay there. Um, and another hydrogen atom will come along and bond and that will create an, a, a, a molecule of water. Now this seems like a very slow way of creating water and it is. Hmm. Over billions of years, billions of years, what you'll find is that um, these dust grains become covered in ice and they eventually go on to form things like asteroids. Um, they, they come together in, under gravity to form asteroids and meteors and comets and, and, and planets even, including our own, the, the Earth. And so if you think about the Earth as created from these, these, these um, water-encrusted grains, I mean, there are all sorts of other grains of um, dust too that the Earth is created from, but this is part of it. It comes together and the first few hundred thousand, hundred million years of the Earth, because there's so much condensing going on of the, of the, of the various parts, dust grains and so on, so much heat, that a lot of the surface water is driven off um, it's too hot for the water to exist there, so it's driven off. There's lots of water still inside the Earth, and we're still discovering that now. There's probably loads of water inside the Earth. But the surface of the Earth is dry. So where does the surface... But well, well, we know that the surface of the Earth is covered in oceans, so where does that come from? Well, part of it comes from the leftovers of the solar system that didn't create planets. So I told you about these grains. They not only created planets, but they also created asteroids and comets. And so at some point in the Earth's history, lots and lots of asteroids and comets collided into the earth like hundreds of millions of years and brought little bits of water with them so that's one source but then since i've written the book what's been what people what scientists have you know, have have discovered is that that can't account for all of the water because it doesn't really match the kind the, the water on asteroids and comets that we've managed to sample and uh, understand doesn't really match the fingerprint of the water that's on the earth. And by fingerprint, what I mean is the ratio of water made from normal hydrogen and the water made from heavy hydrogen, deuterium. And, um, you know, different asteroids and different comets have different ratios of these elements. And the, the earth has a specific fingerprint of a ratio of, of, of water with, with these two different, uh, two different types of hydrogen. So we've been looking for the source. And so, What's been discovered in the last year, actually, maybe in the last few months uh, even, is, is that another source of the Earth's water is that there's plenty of these dust grains from the early solar system still floating around in the Earth, uh, in, in the solar system, rather, still floating around. And over time, radiation from the sun, so we're talking in individual protons, um, higher energy radiation, will fire out from the sun and occasionally hit these dust grains. And the, and the, and the radiation is so intense that it will, it will, it will go a, a nanometer or so into the dust grain and knock out other minerals there and um, bond with any oxygen atoms. So it creates essentially an OH minus ion, a hydroxide, which is a very fundamental part of water. And maybe a million years later, another um, proton from the sun, a hydrogen nucleus, comes and bump, bumps into the same into the same um, uh, dust grain. So you've got this um, dust grain, a tiny dust grain with water inside it now, created by radiation from the sun. Now this might not sound like a lot, and it might again sound like a long time, but over billions of years, this has been happening. And every single day, we have hundreds and hundreds of tons of this dust falling onto the earth. It just falls in, and most of it just, just it gets burned up in the atmosphere. But the water in that dust comes to the surface of the earth, it just rains straight down. So literally for the last few billion years, we've had a rain of cosmic water every single day. So that's where most of it comes from. So in fact, almost all of the water from, on the surface of the earth right now, I, mean, I would say virtually all of it, comes from asteroids, comets, and this sort of dust that the sun has turned into water uh, over time, um, which is fascinating. This is, the, this is just like mind blowing stuff to me, right? Because like, I think, uh, you were always like, oh, all the water that's ever been here, or the water on Earth has always been here, right? It's the same amount. It's been a constant amount since kind of the Earth was formed. That's like, I think, the common person's uh, understanding of water on Earth. Um, that's not the case, huh? It's come in different waves. It's come over time. We could have more water on Earth a million years from now than we do now. 
I mean, because of this cosmic rain, because of asteroids, comets, meteors? Yeah, I mean, uh, the th- that, that, it, theoretically, that's possible. We definitely don't want asteroids and comets to be hitting us at no, any point. No, in the, no, in, no in, not, in lar- the not large ones, right? Yeah, that's for sure. The, 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 the large amounts of water in from um, asteroids and comets that hit the Earth Hit the, it happened well before any life on Earth existed. Okay. And so we were very lucky in that respect that uh, mm. that happened. Um, and we're sort of reaping the benefits of it. The sort of the dust, uh, the, the rain, the dust rain is, has been consistent since, since the beginning of the Earth. Um, and obviously the Earth is four and a half billion years old, so therefore a lot of water has come that way. We reckon about half perhaps has come from this dust. But it's a very slow trickle. So it's not like uh, mm. within our lifetimes or within the next 10,000 years, you'd have lots more. Yes, there would be more, but certainly not enough to sort of deal with some of the issues we have when we're running out of water, for example, because we're using water much more quickly than the Earth can clean it or it can come from space. The fact is that all of the water on, on the surface of the Earth does come from space, but um, it's not being replenished fast enough from any of those sources. And we definitely don't want the asteroid replenishment route because <laughs> that would cause lots more problems. Yeah, absolutely. So so let me just make sure I got that right. About half the water on Earth has come from kind of these asteroids, comets, meteors, a, and a lot of that a long time ago during kind of the early formation time, you know, when, when the universe was yeah. really crazy active and all this was kind of mm-hmm. forming. But then you've had this nice, mm-hmm. steady, slow rain uh, over mm-hmm. billions of years that's added. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, and, and one more yeah. thing to say about that last thing, which I found fascinating when I spoke to the scientists about this, is that the, the, the half of the Earth's water is from this sort of, this dust uh, that's been sort of transformed by the, by the sun. And so it means that if you think about how that dust is created, the, the water, it means protons, hydrogen atoms, the, the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, the protons, have come from the sun into the water and then onto the earth, which means that probably about half of the high, of the water inside you is made from protons that have come directly from the sun. So literally, I mean, we, we, we know that Carl Sagan said that we're all stardust, but mm. this is something else. We are the, the product of active stars. You and me, everything on earth, that contains water contains bits of the sun. Oh, awesome. Awesome stuff. Love it. Um, and then I guess other planets, right. That, that have water or have had water, same process. It got there by the same, same process. Uh, the conditions on these planets aren't the same as they are on earth. So it's either, you know, not conducive to that water staying or whatever it might be, right. Like Mars, for example, could you talk kind of about the, uh, the extra, the, the water on other planets and, and that situation. So this is something that um, scientists have really got to grips with in the last 20 or 30 years. It turns out there's a lot more water in the solar system and beyond than anyone ever thought. Nearly every object in our solar system, every celestial object has water in it. So um, obviously the earth has, we know that Venus has water, even the, um, the, the south pole of Mercury, the closest planet to the sun has ice. Um, we know there's evidence of, of water on Mars. Um, there's even evidence of water, solid mountains of ice on Pluto. Everywhere, it's everywhere. And some of the moons of, of Jupiter and Saturn are particularly interesting on this front because uh, Enceladus, for example, which is a moon of Saturn, is uh, has been discovered to be essentially it, it's got a thick crust of ice on the top and then hundreds of kilometers of water underneath. Uh, a moon of um, Jupiter, Europa, is very similar. Um, There's it's lots and lots of liquid water. Um, and as we look further beyond the solar system, um, we find that uh, the, the, we find trillions, we've found billions of planets. And um, there've been thousands confirmed, but we know there must be billions or even trillions of planets sort of orbiting stars in our, in our, in our galaxy. And many of them indicate signs of water, which means that, you know, we look at the way that they're orbiting the stars and their mass and their size and so on, and we infer they must have water in them. And in the coming decade, we'll be able to actually take pictures of them and see if there are water or there's clouds and that kind of thing. So water is absolutely everywhere. And one of the most interesting reasons why we look for water anywhere else is because we know what water did on this planet. Mm. It created life on this planet. And so if it did it on this planet, why not somewhere else? One of the other fun parts of the book, and that's connected to all of this, is you talk about how water uh, kind of connects us to 
both our ancient ancestors and potentially to extraterrestrial life. Uh, could you could you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So this was something that you know when you think about these things a lot, you sort of realize that these connections exist and perhaps people haven't drawn them before, which is that, you know, if you think about the very first humans, you know, if, if you had a time machine and you go back to the first anatomically recognizable humans, we're talking maybe two or 300,000 years ago, um, somewhere in the, in the plains of what is now Central Africa, um, and you go and meet those humans and you, they recognize you as a human as well, you definitely wouldn't be able to speak their language or communicate with them in any meaningful way. You definitely wouldn't probably eat what they're eating, <laughs> but you would drink water and they would understand exactly what water is. They would understand, and you would understand, and you'd use the same water to do the same things. Uh, and, and you know, that water is the thing that connects you to them because it's the same water. The water they're using is the same water we're using hundreds of thousands of years later. And I mentioned earlier that NASA and others are looking for water on other planets. And the reason we want to investigate it is that water, because it has all these strange properties uh, where it can sort of choreograph other molecules into doing things or building things, or it can behave in a certain way where it dissolves objects, uh, dis dissolves other compounds so that it can transport nutrients and things around your body. You know, because of water can do all these things, it's such an important liquid in in creating life and creating the life on earth. If it exists in other places where the conditions are similar to that of earth, in other words, there's water, there's other minerals that could make life, then why wouldn't life start in those places too? Um, if we think that life is just a chemical process, at the beginning at least, um, then why wouldn't it start in other places? And we've never really had any places to search for you know, to, to, to do experiments with or to understand whether that's possible or not. But now that we know that there's liquid oceans on places like Enceladus or, um, or, or Europa, and that we can possibly send missions to those places. In fact, there's a, there's a mission in, in plans by NASA to send essentially a boat to go and mm -hmm. sail on the seas of Enceladus and Europa, um, or take samples of that water to see if there's anything that resembles life. Because what's interesting about Enceladus and Europa, for example, is that they, they are essentially liquid water on top of what we assume is a is, a, is a, a rocky sort of core, a rocky core which is made up of the same stuff that the Earth is made from because everything in the um, solar system is made from the same stuff uh, ultimately. And so in the history of the Earth, one theory three and a half billion years ago is that life started at the bottom of the oceans where there are hydrothermal vents, these places where there's huge amounts of hot water flowing from the sort of bottom of the um, oceans. There's lots of hot water there, so energy. There's lots of minerals, rich minerals, that can kind of create interesting compounds that might be the precursors of life. And those, if, if this is correct, that that is where life on Earth started and then developed into all of the rich diversity we see around us through water, then those, those conditions may well, are very likely, in fact, to exist at the bottom of the, um, of the uh, ocean in Enceladus or Europa or other parts of the solar system where there's liquid oceans. There's no reason why that couldn't be true. But we need to go and find out, right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, those life forms haven't evolved into something intelligent, but there's no reason to think that microbes, bacteria, those sorts of things might not have existed there. So if we want to understand the question of why life is, um, uh, exists, if life exists anywhere else, we need to understand water and find it in elsewhere. And if we do find life elsewhere, whether it's a, a microbe or, or if it's an intelligent alien, then you can bet that it's water that's helped that life form be created in the first place. So, you know, if we look further into the galaxy and, and we, we find that there is a life form out there and it uses some other molecule than DNA to transfer information from one generation to the next and uses some other molecule than proteins to actually build itself, um, because the, these are things that you know human uh, life on Earth does, but it doesn't that's not necessary anywhere else. Even if the alien life form uses different molecules for these basic functions of life, you can be almost guaranteed that the thing it uses to make all of that life function is water. Mm. It will be the only thing that connects us to that that life form, because water is so unique. It, there's no other molecule in the entire universe that can do all the things it does. Um, to that and 
the, 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 and life needs all of these different functions of it in order to do all of its bits and pieces. So water will exist in that other life form, I, I'm, I'm betting. Yeah. Um, and so that it will be the thing that connects us to the other alien life form whenever we find it. Well, that, that kind of leads me a little bit to the last thing you tackle in your book, and that's about alternatives to water, right? Like this is so unique. It's so present across the universe. It's so critical to our, our life and our existence here on Earth. We've got all the, the serious water scarcity issues and pollution of water. So when you, when you look at alternatives to water, uh, what did that involve and, and what did you explore there? Everything I've discussed so far is that we, water is uh, a chemical that we can kind of describe in plain terms, but then when it becomes, but when we start to try and understand it in its bulk properties, it starts to behave in a sort of slightly odd way. Now, none of it is magic, of course. It's just all chemistry, but it's just complicated chemistry. And, and, and sometimes we don't understand things. It seems magical, right? But water does all these strange things, like I said, like um, floating on, the, the, the ice floating on its own liquid or um, moving up against the force of gravity, up small tubes. And these are things that life um, uses to its advantage. Uh, to, for example, um, the, the, for example, the fact that it can dissolve um, almost anything means that a bloodstream, um, it, your bloodstream can take nutrients from your stomach all the way to all the other parts of your body because you know if all the nutrients didn't dissolve in water then it couldn't transport that stuff to anywhere else and so it'd be useless and so that's why water is important for life now it's a good thought experiment to try and understand well so if water didn't exist could life still exist well i mean it could and you could you can find all sorts of chemicals um that exist uh, on Earth, you can either make them artificially or they exist naturally. They kind of do a few of the things that um, water does. So water has something like, and I can't remember the last count, it's something like fifty or sixty anomalous properties. Wow. And um, and and so um, and, and many of these properties are important for functions of life. And you can find other um, chemicals that can do maybe six or seven of these weird things. Maybe some of them have a very high specific heat capacity, or maybe some of them can transport energy in different ways, or maybe some of them are good at dissolving things. Um, now, the, the, uh, I, I could list some of the chemicals. They've got quite long organic uh, compound names. But I think that the, the, point, the point is that you can, if you were to take, like, let's say, six or seven of these different chemicals, mix them together in a mixture, that could create another medium in which, let's say, a life form might evolve and take advantage of those different properties. Problem is that all of those chemicals are very rare in the universe. They don't naturally occur at the same level as water does. Water literally is, the, as I think I said, second most common molecule in the universe. It's everywhere. It's on every dust grain, every celestial object um, there's clouds of water floating around the universe it's made from simple molecules and a uh, simple uh, chemical it's made from simple elements and it's a simple molecule in itself and it just it's just easy to make whereas these other alternatives that you might consider are quite complicated organic molecules with dozens of um, atoms in them which are necessarily therefore more complicated to create and therefore there'll be fewer of them it's not that these things can't be made. It's just that you know the more complicated um, a molecule is, it just it's just there's less of it in the in the universe, um, and so it just means that although it's not impossible that an alternative to water exists somewhere in some far flung corner of the universe and is happily creating life, it will be a real niche thing. It, it you know lo uh, the universe physics all these things they like simple answers to things mm. and if you've got something that already has all of these amazing properties in the universe and it's everywhere already it would seem odd not impossible but certainly seem odd to have something that's um something else to try and replace um uh, the properties of water mm. yeah so uh, take care of the water that we have here put a barrel outside and catch some cosmic rain. That's really, that's really what we're stu <laughs> stuck with. Right. Um, last question. And, and this is probably a, a big one. Um, is there anything that, that, uh, 
are the big mysteries of water. You know, we, we understand so much as you've gone into about how water behaves, where it came from, uh, and, you know, it's, it's importance to life. Uh, are there any big mysteries that are just kind of right in front of the scientific community? Um, so water is probably the most studied liquid in human history. Uh, and even though it's the most studied, it's the least understood. Um, that's a quote from um, a very famous chemist, Felix Franks. Um, and and what, what I think he was trying to say there was that, you know, we have been around water for our entire lives, uh, entire species, entire existence of our species, and tried to understand what it is. And in the last few hundred years, we've used science to try and understand it from a molecular level. And there's lots and lots of questions. We've discovered all these anomalies. And uh, now we don't have to understand them all to the chemical level to then be able to understand um, how to use water, how to sort of conserve it, how to look after it. Um, but it's a target, right? Now, we still don't really understand um, why it is that um, liquid water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. So I told you that water um, gets more, uh, you know, gets, uh, well, when it gets colder and colder, um, it, um, it actually expands when it becomes a solid, when it becomes ice. But there's a, there's a crossover point. At four degrees Celsius, water is at its most dense. And after that, it starts to become less dense and it, becomes, and it ends up in this sort of crystal pattern, which is the mm. ice molecule, uh, ice crystal, sorry. And so why is, why is that? Well, why is it at four degrees Celsius? It, it, there, there's some theories around the fact that water in its liquid form isn't just one liquid. There's two different types of liquids in there sort of mixed together that are sort of fighting against each other constantly, that do, do, doing two different things. And recent research has showed that that's probably true, that there's two different types of water because as well as it being just a normal chemical, it's sort of floating around with those, the, when you think of a, a liquid, you think of uh, molecules just sort of bumping into each other and floating around in whatever container it's in. Because water has these ch electric charges around it, it sort of it navigates itself a bit more. It controls itself a bit more. It's a bit more, um, it's a bit more structured um, than than a, 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 a any other liquid. Now, why is that? Um, why is it that um, in, in a liquid um, water, when the when the molecules come together and attract each other, um, they, they don't sort of sort of just attract each other and then bounce off again. They will often form networks of of, of, of molecules which are. You know, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of molecules long. They form these networks, then break apart again, form new networks. So that makes water behave in a very different way to other liquids. Now, why does it do that? Don't know. You know, <laughs> um, why, why? Why is it that uh, you know? Why is it that um, uh, we we kind of understand, for example, why water has a very high specific heat capacity? So water is um, is uh, uh, it, it takes a lot of energy to boil water. And you'll know this, of course, if you try, ever try and boil water or pasta or whatever, it takes ages for the water to actually get up to temperature because it can hold a lot of energy before it changes phase from liquid to gas. And part of the reason, again, is because of these hydrogen bonds that stick the uh, water molecules together. So you just need to, not only do you need to get over the gas phase change, but also you need to give energy to break these hydrogen bonds. So we know that. But why does no other molecule, no other liquid, do something similar. Well, why is it that water is so good at this? If you think about other uh, molecules that have the same molecular weight as water, so then something like ammonia, for example, um, or um, even something that's double the molecular weight of water, hydrogen sulfide, which is a quite a nasty gas. The, the, ammonia and hydrogen sulfide are gases. At the temperature on the surface of the earth, they're gases. Water is not a gas at the temperatures at the surface of the earth. It's mostly a liquid. Now there are gases that we have water vapor, of course, in the, in the air, but there's lots of water liquid around. And it's just bizarre that on the surface of the earth, we've got all three forms of water in the, in the same, essentially in the same uh, environmental conditions. Um, you know, things like that are mysteries that are gonna keep water scientists going for a long, long time. But Alec, uh, great, great stuff. Again, I encourage people to check out your book. It's called The Water Book. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it a lot and uh, appreciate your time for this conversation. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Waterloop. Thank you for listening to this episode. And thanks again to Springpoint Partners for grant funding. 
Remember, you can support the Waterloop nonprofit media outlet at patreon.com slash the Waterloop. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.